Well, hello everyone and praise the Lord. Welcome to Power Principles. I'm your host, Dr. Van Gaten. I'm the academic dean at the Williams Bible Institute and Seminary at the Church 320 in Jacksonville, Florida, under the leadership of Bishop Stan Williams. And it's a pleasure to be with you today. And let me begin, as always, to make a few announcements. First of all, number one, I want to remind you that uh, I've written a book called The Good News for Racism, From Liberation to Reconciliation. And uh, you can go to Kindle on Amazon.com and get it in paperback or on Kindle. And it's available. And with the issues that are on our nation today, I'm telling you, uh, this is a good read. It's not real long. For those of you that aren't given to a lot of reading, this will suffice your needs uh, because it's comprehensive yet not exhaustive. So please take advantage of it. Um, and it's, it's centered on the gospel. What does the gospel say about racism? And at the end of the book, you'll find that I deal with reconciliation because there's no sense of Christians talking about these issues if our goal is not to be reconciled to God and with one another. So please take advantage of that. Also, we have a Bible, we have a school here, a Christian school, seminary right here. I'm the academic dean, and we have online classes. And so <clears throat> we're just finishing up here at the Church 320 with another semester for the summer. And you can go online and from your home, from your library, in your own convenience and time. You can take the same courses, yet right online for you. So please avail yourself. Each course is eight weeks long, so take advantage of it. We want to see your name on the roll that you've taken these classes. Uh, so there you have it. All right, let's get back to the, uh, the lesson today. We're going back to Hebrews, where we left off, Hebrews chapter 12. But be just before I go there, I told you that one of my goals is to present that the gospel, the Bisarat in Ethiopian, um, that piety and protest go together. We must live a holy life. But we also recognize that the black church was born a resistance movement, which was by protest. And so the word of God uh, shows in the very definition of the word. When you look up in the Hebrew and Greek, the term righteousness and the word justice are the same, but one reflects the work of God inwardly. That's righteousness. And the, work of the, the word justice is the external work. What is in your heart will come out, but we want the word of God to be in us so deeply that we're concerned about everyone getting justice in this world. So uh, I want to share some things on the protest side before I go to the piety side, because it's not either or, it's both and, all right? So uh, social justice, right now, <clears throat> we've got a big trial going on right now. The jury is deliberating, and we don't know for sure. I'm not a prophet. I can't tell you what they're going to come out and say, but I knew, do know that we should be praying, praying for the jury that, that justice will prevail in this case. And I so appreciate the prosecutors because <clears throat> not only did they do a good job in this court case with Chavez, Derek Chavez, the policeman that killed uh, our brother, uh, George Floyd, and, uh, but they, they made it clear that the prosecutors are saying, this is not a trial of all policemen. This is the trial of one policeman who did wrong. But we are proud of and thank God for all the good police people that are out there on the beat doing a very dangerous job. We thank God for them. We pray for them. Uh, I have a lot of personal friends who are policemen. That's not the issue. But in every profession, including preaching, there are some bad apples, and they need to be dealt with. So one bad apple can spoil a whole, ruin it for everybody. So that's something we need to be praying about. We may be hearing at any moment what their verdict is, and we trust that the people will not riot there. They can peacefully protest, but please don't riot. Don't burn buildings and houses. Uh, that's wrong. Uh, 
Uh, that is not going to solve anything. In fact, some of the peaceful protesters were telling the crowds, don't throw anything at the policemen. And one person, all it takes is one person to throw something, and it just messes it up for everyone. And that's what happened at the Capitol, too. They all went there to storm the Capitol. So it's not just black folks in the hood. It's people in Washington, D.C. going up. And yet we all know that had the Capitol been attacked by blacks the way it was by whites, uh, there would have been a major problem, and a whole lot of people would have got killed because of that. So that's just the way it is. Also, I want to make mention of the fact that here in Florida, <clears throat> Governor DeSantis has passed a bill that uh, called uh, against an anti-riot protest bill. But the only problem, now, now anti-riots, we should all be against rioting. We don't see any good thing coming out of a riot. But the good things to have historically for the black community come out of peaceful protests. I mean, that's what Martin Luther King Jr. did. The young people at the lunch counter, uh, they were peacefully protesting, and good came out of it. But riots is something else. But DeSantis has passed a bill that if, three, if more than three people gather to do a silent, peaceful protest, you can be arrested now in Florida and kept in jail until uh, you come before your judge. Now, the question becomes, what has gone down in Florida that we need to have such a bill? Uh, it gives the appearance of something racist happening within DeSantis there, and I'm not calling, I said it gives the appearance. It gives the appearance. And I wish I could sit down and talk with him because I think it's important that when people who are white that are in power to pass bills, they ought to have black folks at the table can tell them the ramifications of a particular bill on the marginalized, the minority. And if they don't take that into consideration, then they really don't care about us. That's important that we understand that. And so I'm not a Democrat. I'm not Republican. I'm an independent. That's how I'm minister. And my point is this. I, I hate seeing the church divided over, are you with Biden or are you with Trump? Some that are with Trump won't even call Biden President Biden. Well, tr Trump is not president anymore. President Biden is. But my point is this. Uh, we should be praying and influencing both parties. Uh, there's nothing in the kingdom of God that's Republican. There's nothing in the kingdom of God that is Democrat. The kingdom of God, God is king and Lord and God all by himself. And so we should be salt and light. You can influence the Republicans, and we should as Christians. We need to influence the Democrats, but, but we recognize that both of them are no replacement for the Lord Jesus Christ himself. One, the Democrats are stirring up a whole lot of bills, and, you know, we got uh, uh, the abortion bill and all kinds of other things. But, you know, but, but the Republicans, uh, they got the KKK and, and the Proud Boys. and uh, There's evil on both sides. There's things that are against the word of God in both political parties, and we should influence them for the good. But those, those differences, those two parties, that tribalism, it should not... Uh, separate believers because uh, we are we're holding fast to the head the head is not Biden the head is not Trump the head is the Lord Jesus Christ Yeshua HaMashiach so we need to recognize that and be true and I'll tell you that I'll be honest with you though that uh, although uh, I am not Democrat or Republican one thing that really troubled me about Trump is that I love him as a person because as Christians we're to love everybody so I love him as a person, but I hate his rhetoric, the way he called people names. You know, in the neighborhoods that most of us grew up in, uh, if he'd have talked like that in our neighborhoods, he'd have suffered a beat down because we wouldn't have put up with that, calling people names and things. No, 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 that is so, that is so bad. So, and I, I, I'm, one thing about him not being president right now is I don't have to hear all that talk because it bothered me that one human being talks about another human being that way. And yes, he did do it in public. He didn't do it in private. But anyhow, when this jury comes out, we need to be praying that uh, it, the whole world is watching. And this is a moment 
that we can justify racism in this country. And I would love to see the white church stand with the black church against social injustices throughout this land. Stand with us. If you're a believer on the Lord Jesus Christ, then we are your neighbors. Love your neighbors, and we love you as well. And so we are the ones that have been oppressed historically in this nation, and the white church cannot be silent. She, you must speak up. Pastors, you must speak up. And it's time out for white America trying to explain our plight when they've never read any of our books and know our truth from one of us. And so if you want to know, understand black history, then listen to a academic black hi Christian historian. And so I want to throw that out at you. All right, so we can go now to the word of God. There's so many other things I could say, but we need, we're in this world, although we're not of this world. And because we're in this world and not of this world, uh, that's what brings us to the book of Hebrews, because in, as I started out last week, which was part one, uh, we talked from Hebrews 12, and one it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and sin that so easily entangles, and let us run. And that's what I want to use. It's time to run. With all that's going on in our country, that's going on in the world, all the shootings in America right now, even this morning, it is time for believers, black, white, Latino, Chinese, Asian, doesn't matter, Republican, Democrat, whatever you're, if you love the Lord Jesus Christ, it's time for the church to run. Because if the church was doing what the church is called to do and be, then half the problems in this world would have been solved already. We're behind the times, and sometimes we act worse than the people on the streets. And right now, I, I, I love the church, but I'm ashamed of the church right now. We're not doing our job. We're not being the light. We're not being the salt. But it's time to run, to get up and run. So this is taken from the book of Hebrews, and, and, and yet we recognize that there were uh, exactly uh, several things that are covered in this that there are six major aspects to this time to run. There's a goal, there's an inspiration, there's a handicap, there is a means, there is a presence, and there is an example. So from Hebrews chapter 12, you need to back up, because remember the Bible is not divided up in chapters by the Spirit of God. This is a man-made invention. But I notice in chapter 10 of Hebrews, beginning at verse 35, I love this verse. Hebrews 10, 35. The writer of Hebrews says, So do not throw away your confidence. Do not throw away. Listen, some people are discouraged. They're stressed out. It's easily to get to that. But even if you've been on the protest side, you can get easily discouraged. That's why you must spend time on the piety side, which is basking in the love of Almighty God and worshiping and being filled with his power and his presence, reviving us. But he's, the writer of Hebrews says, so do not throw away your confidence, which will be richly rewarded, richly rewarded, all right? You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, see, when you've done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised for in just a little while, he is coming and will not delay, but the righteous will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased in him. The Lord doesn't want us to shrink back now during these times. The church shouldn't be hiding in a corner, crawling down into a hole somewhere. No, we're supposed to, as the world gets darker, we're supposed to rise and shine for the light has come upon us. The glory of God has come upon us. And the world in darkness ought to see the light of Jesus Christ in our lives. So it's time to run. It's time to run. So we talked about how we have, uh, we have a goal. And our goal as believers is to be like him. That should be the goal of this race. We're running to be like him. We're pressing forward. We're pressing on in the Lord because our goal is to be like him to have an experience, experience with God that we go through a metamorphosis. We are changed into his image and his likeness. 
and he is our goal. That every day we can judge ourselves. Did I act more like Jesus today than I did yesterday? We've got to really press in. We're pilgrims. And then we have a goal. But it also says we have a great cloud of witnesses. And that great cloud of witnesses are all the people in Hebrews chapter 11 that the writer talks about that have gone before us and they believe God and some of them uh, did great things and others were tortured and slain and uh, sawn asunder and fed to lions. All of those things took place. But listen, we can't allow anything in this world to deter us from our God that the will of God will not lead us where the grace of God will not keep us. So this is time for the church to run, to run. Jesus has already won his race so that we are in him so we can win our race because he's doing a good work in us. So we have a goal. Number two, we have an inspiration we, where it says looking unto Jesus, that word looking in the Greek, it means looking away, looking away. In other words, we've got to stay focused. We can't be distracted. We can't get off in all these different... We've got to have singleness of vision that we know what, our, what we're after. We know where the finish line is, and we know that this world... I love the, uh, Tom Skinner. He's passed away, but he came to Buffalo one time, and I, I, I heard him speak, and I had dinner with him one night. And he had a quote that I've never forgotten. He said, it is the purpose of God through the establishment of the church to produce on earth a redeemed community whose citizenship is in heaven, who will live out the lifestyle of heaven right here on earth. And if heaven is greater than the earth because what? God is in the heavens. God dwells in the theophonic cloud, the cloud of his presence, the cloud of his glory. And so we're, we're, heaven is our home. To be with Jesus, Jesus said in John, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. And if that's what's waiting, then we can handle what goes on down here. Time on earth is the vestibule to eternity. There's no comparison. We live how many years? 70, 80, 90 years down here, and then all of eternity with him. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more sickness and disease, no more troubles. Listen, for a few years down here, you get to spend all of eternity. So keep your eyes, look away, stay focused, stay focused and run. And when you're running, you've got to be focused so you don't trip up and mess up on the run because you never know. It says, you know, that's important for us to keep our eyes on this thing. So we have an inspiration, singleness of vision. We need to look. We have the, we have the look of hope. We have the look of obedience. We have the look of self-denial. Keep your eye. Look away to hope, to obedience, to self-denial so we can finish the race of God. And it says, but lay aside every weight and sin that does so easily beset you. So there is the thought of we all, every athlete knows that there are different weights when you're just training. But when you get ready to run the race, you make sure you, you, you get down wrestling or running on the track. You change your shoes. You want to be light. You dress lightly. Why? Because you're getting ready to run. But, you know, spiritually, we all have handicaps. We have habits. We have habits of pleasure, self-indulgences, uh, we have associations that can get in our way. And so we need to lay aside every sin and weight. If we're running, that's all heavy baggage to us. Let, let it go. Let it go. If you're going to run, be disciplined. Let it go. In the, it says, let us run the race that is set before us. And in the Greek, that word for race gives the idea that nobody, no two people's race, races are the same. Everybody's got a different race that God has ordained for you. In every race, uh, you ever see those steeple chases, they call them? They're running around a track, then they have to jump over a bar, and then they got to run through the water and all. Well, listen, life is like that. You're running for Jesus, and all of a sudden, here comes out from the left and from the right and a blowtorch, and, and you run into this problem and that problem. Listen, everybody's race is tailor-made for you. And if God allows you to run that race, he will give you the grace to finish that race. We can finish. 
I never ran a marathon that I did not finish, but it was hard. And the grace of God, we can lean on Jesus, and he will bring us to the end because our eyes are on him. So we, you know, the, the very habits and pleasures of this world, it's in the very air of our time. It's in the air that we breathe. It's everywhere. It's on TV. It's radio. It's walking down the streets. It's doing everything. So we've got to stay focused, and we've got to lay aside every weight and sin that so easily besets us. And everybody has a propensity, a proclivity for a particular expression that a weakness, a sinful you know it's your weakness. And a man's strength is to know his weakness and mortify, put to tourniquet, put to death all the deeds of the flesh. The fourth thing that the writer says to them in running this race is that we have a means. We have a means. In other words, we're called to be steadfast. Steadfast endurance. We are to be refused to be denied. We're a people that refuse to be denied even or... But we may be delayed, but is not denied. And that's important for us to really comprehend that we are plodding through uneventful, an uneventful life. Sometimes it's just plot on, plot on, and it looks like there's just nothing happening. It's uneventful. But you've got to learn how to plot on even through the uneventful, that, that God is in the mundane. That Just remember, many people, Moses was watching sheep. When God called him, that's a mundane lifestyle. He was watching sheep when all of a sudden the theophonic cloud of God came and God spoke from the burning bush, you know, supernaturally. He had a supernatural encounter. The extraordinary event came through ordinary events. So while you're washing dishes, cutting your lawn, working on your job, we need to live with an expectation that any moment God's going to show up and show out to me, God will do that, but we've got to persevere. We can, we, uh, we've got to press on, uh, no giving up. Good, better, best, never let it rest until the good gets better and the better is best. That's the way we need to believe. Then number five, we see that uh, we have an example. Looking unto Jesus, Yeshua, who despised not the shame that was before him, We've got to look to Christ. He is our great example, Jesus. He, he bore the reproach in humility. Jesus was willing to go through what he went through, all the pains, the loneliness, the cross, the beatings on the Via Della Rosa that he went through. All, why? Because he loved his father and he loved his creation. For God so loved the world. And you know, when it comes to preaching the gospel, I tell people all the time, there's an objective side of the gospel and there's a subjective side of the gospel. And the objective side of the gospel is when you tell people what God has done and what's God's attitude towards us. It's love. That's why he went to the cross. Look what God has done because he cares about you, because he loves you. That's the objective side of the cross. Now, the subjective side of the gospel is our response to what he has done and who he is. And too many times, gospel preachers, we are preaching the subjective side, what we do, instead of making God attractive to them by simply stating who he is. You don't have to be given to exaggerated felicitations. God says, I am that I am. Ergo a me, ergo a me. I am God. And listen, he is a beautiful for situation. So just paint the picture in the spirit of who God is and from his word and let the Holy Spirit reveal him to the people you're talking to and then they will want to repent and they will want to serve the Lord and they'll want to give up their sinful ways. But don't preach on those things. We preach on God. We preach on the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the eschatological manifestation of the ground of being, the kerygma manifested in conflict, the self-realization of per personhood, the motivational encounter for the socializing and humanizing of mankind. He is transcendent ego. Tell the people who God is. He is 
the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star, the comfort of all nations, bless his holy name. If we talk about him that way, then people will desire him. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. So let's be sure to do that. And last of all, not only do we have Jesus, but we have a presence. We have a presence. He is the goal and the companion. He said, I am with you till the end. The cloud of his presence led them through the wilderness, the children of Israel. And the Holy Spirit, he told them in the book of Acts, upon the mountain, I am with you until the end of the age. He's talking about the disciples. And he's with you. He's with me. So we need to, it's time to run. It's time to run, run, run. The race that God has given you. We're not all running the same kind of race, but we are all called to run. And it's time in America, with all the things that are going on, it's for the time for the church to do exactly what Hebrews says to do. Don't cast off your confidence, which has great reward coming for it, but we need to look at the cloud of witnesses. They're, they're winners. They already made it. Hebrews chapter 11, they're already there. They've won the race. They're, they have arrived, and they're cheering us on. You can win your race. And I don't know what, how you're running today. I don't know what you're running to. You should be running to the Lord, but I don't know what you're running from. And the only thing we want to run from is sin. Like Joseph, we want to get out of there. Get out of there. But run to the Lord. Be quick to run to Jesus today. Be quick to run in his footsteps. Follow him. Let him disciple us and let him lead us and let him guide. It's time to run. It's time. God does not want us to draw back. He, the Hebrew writer does not, did not want the people of God, the, the Messianic Jews, going through a hard time. He didn't want them to draw back and give up and quit and return to their old lifestyle. But he wanted them to run the race. Keep your eyes on the great cloud of witnesses. Keep on the, stay connected to brothers and sisters who are choosing to run for the Lord. And let us run together the race that Almighty God has given us. We can make it to the finish line. It is a wonderful thing to cross over the finish line. Every race I ran, I had to run my own race. I wasn't fast like everybody else. But when I crossed that finish line, 26 miles, 385 yards, I'll tell you, it was a dream come true. I finished the course with joy. And I pray today that each one of you will hear him say, well done as you cross your finish line, for you finish your course with joy. It's time to run. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this day for your grace and for your mercy. We pray for our nation right now in light of the court case taking on that you will speak through the jurors, that you'll give us justice. And you know everything that's going on in our nation right now, the shootings, Lord God, the racial tension, Lord God, and the church is even divided over it. We are acting just like Democrats and Republicans when we are all one family serving one God. Lord, help us to run this race for your glory and honor for your glory and for your honor alone. So may the Lord bless you today and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon each one of you and give you peace in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. Amen. God bless.